show. There are a few things that I'm going to talk to you about today. Ernie Chambers is my name for those who don't recognize me or know who that is. But anyway, we have health problems in our community that everybody else has, but ours are aggravated in the same way that everything else that is negative is worse and harder on us than it is others. We don't control anything of significance. Now we might have a little influence here, a little influence there, but when it comes to the final decision, there's always somebody white who can make that decision. Now I have a law degree from Creighton. I have handled cases for myself that I've won, traffic cases, one where a grand jury issued a report and attacked me in that report. Nobody had ever gone to the Nebraska Supreme Court to have a grand jury report expunged from the court record, but I did. I did the research, wrote my brief, and pointed out to the Supreme Court that this is the first time that such a case came before it, so could I go beyond the number of pages limited for briefs? And they said yes, and I won. I'll tell you why I'm saying that. I don't care how much I know about the law. I don't care how much I know about the constitution. I could repeat it word for word from memory, but there's gonna be some white person or a group of white people who will determine the ultimate outcome. I could have lost that case if the state Supreme Court had decided to ignore the law and rule that I lost. That is what I mean by the final decision always being in a white person's hands. So when we have an issue, we are ultimately going to be affected by what some white person or group have determined will be our role or the amount of victimization we will face. So when it comes to health, unfortunately, the same thing is there. There's one item though, where the white people are not at fault. That's getting vaccinations against COVID. When COVID junior is what I will call the first round came out, everybody had kind of panicked. Trump had said, don't worry about it. It's like the flu. He'd even suggested that people could drink bleach because if bleach would work in purifying and making germ-free surfaces, why not take it? inside and let it do the same thing. When he was ridiculed, he said, oh, well, I was just kidding. No, he wasn't. He tried to pretend that the COVID infestation, infliction, pandemic, whatever term you want to apply to it, was not as bad as what Dr. Fauci and other experts had said it was. There were people who listened to a person who knows nothing about it. And the fallout from that is still happening today. There are disputes in schools around the country as to whether children should wear masks. There is a, I started to say president because he's backed by Trump, but the governor of Texas said there will be no mask mandate in the public schools in Texas, children, don't have to get vaccinated. His are not going to. Parents make that decision. But I think men like him lie. I believe they are the first ones to seek out whatever medical protection or preventative care is available. When Trump got a touch of it, they took him to uh, a military hospital near Washington, DC. And he was given a kind of treatment that no private citizen is going to receive. And then when they were able to bring it under control, he said, see what I told you? So those people who follow him ignored the fact that he went for treatment. He had doctors. He had, if he needed a ventilator, a ventilator. The public never was told the extent of the treatment he received 
but you can bet that his son got whatever treatment was needed. You can bet that his wife got whatever treatment or vaccinations would be available. But there are still people out here who follow him like the lemmings. Those are little creatures, something like rodents. And periodically, they will run over the edge of a cliff and they follow. Whichever lemming is, front of the, is in front is the one, the one behind will follow. Wherever that one goes, the rest will follow. So these people have allowed a serious medical matter, a deadly disease to be politicized in terms of whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. I'm neither one. I don't belong to a political party. My loyalty, my allegiance is pledged to myself because ultimately I'm going to be responsible for everything that I do, but I cannot make anybody do anything. I got my vaccinations and I wanna thank my daughter for being able to inform me of where to go and when, and even how to get to the building on the boys' home campus where I'd get the vaccination. Well, the first one I got, then when I knew ahead of time when the second one would come, I contacted a reporter with the World Herald so he could be there and do whatever kind of story he wanted. As it turned out, he took a photograph, several, but one appeared on the front page of the World Herald with me getting my vaccination. If I am a person who wants to give advice to other people, not as an expert, not as the final authority, but based on my best judgment, which in turn is based on what I have read, what I've heard from sources that I have confidence in, scientific and medical. And whatever conclusions they arrive at, I offer those to people. Because I was convinced from the outset that the COVID-19, and by that way, way that stands for Coronavirus Disease 2019. So that's where COVID-19, the name of it comes from. It was real. As soon as somebody like Trump and those other idiotic people who echo what he says began to say there's nothing to it. I knew it was very serious. I got my vaccinations. If it's determined that a booster shot is necessary, I'm going to get it. Anytime I go around other people, I wear a mask. Keep this in mind, brothers, sisters, friends, enemies, and neutrals. When I wear a mask, it's not to protect me from you. It's to protect you. It's to protect you from me. I wear the mask because I do owe a responsibility to my brothers, to my sisters. And as I've stated on numerous occasions, any human being born of a man and a woman, if it's a male, it's my brother. If it's a female, it's my sister. Unfortunately for me, being black, my white brothers and sisters don't feel the same way toward me. And the Bible said, render not evil for evil, but rather overcome evil with good. Nice advice, but it doesn't work even in the funny papers. However, I know how to avoid people and situations that are not going to turn out correctly or as they should if I don't have to be in those situations. I'm not going to force my opinions on anybody. Nobody's opinion will be forced on me. Why should I get angry because a man or a woman or the two of them together are so foolish that they are not going to have their children vaccinated? I cannot make them do that. They're not going to do it. If I trouble my mind with it, all it does is create internal stress and pressure for me about something and I can do nothing about it. So all I have are my words and I offer them what they may be worth. People who might see this will say, they ain't worth nothing to me. Or if they're white, they do not carry any weight with me. 
well, let it be. I'm still going to do what I think I ought to do. I'm going to say what I ought to say. Most people, if they saw a person reading a book or being inattentive and they were at a very busy intersection and were going across the street against the light, they would holler and call their attention to, hey, look out, the light's red, here comes a car. Even people of a different race will do that usually. So there is something automatic in people if they will let it flow, let it take its course, not be artificially swayed by nonsense and foolishness from the outside that will make them do most of the time that which is the right thing to do and help where they can. So I'm going to do what I think is the right thing to do. And I wanted to let you know in the beginning that whatever is confronted by the white people, we face it to a much greater extent. When I talk about things such as this, strokes, there are experts, there is science, there is medical evidence, and I would go to the best source available to me to get that. So what I'm going to share with you today was generated by the Mayo Clinic. I could not find what in my mind is a better source. There may be some just as good, but not better in my opinion. So I'm telling you my source. In the United States, stroke is the fourth leading cause of death in this country. First is heart disease. Second is cancer. Third is that chronic respiratory disease, whatever form it takes, then comes stroke. Some people feel that because it's discussed, it's not really that serious perhaps, but when it is the fourth leading cause of death, we better take it seriously. The good news, according to the Mayo Clinic experts, and by the way, when they arrive at a conclusion, it's not where a doctor just sits down and says, hmm, in my opinion, they base it on studies, on clinics, on research, and then others will check their conclusions to be sure that they are as valid according to scientific or medical standards, as these conclusions can be, then they're let loose to the public. The good news is that fewer Americans die of strokes today than was the case 20 or 30 years ago. Still, stroke is the fourth leading cause of death. Improvement and control of risk factors is probably responsible for the decline. And you know what one of the big risk factors is smoking. There was a time everybody thought it was cool to smoke. Well, it will cool you. Something like the cultures that sung about poison ivy, late at night while you're sleeping, poison ivy starts to creeping around, round, round. <laughs> Measles make you bumpy. Mumps will make you lumpy. Chicken pox will make you jump and twitch. A common cold can fool you and whooping cough can cool you. But poison ivy, Lord, will make you itch. Some of these diseases can fool you and then cool you. Pain may not accompany. Warning signs may not be given. All of a sudden, you're walking. The next thing you know, you're being carried. So if there are things we can do to preserve the health that we have, we ought to do that because prevention is better than cure. Here's a little rhyme. I like rhymes. He spent his health to get his wealth. And then with might and main, 
he spent his wealth to get his health back again. You lose that which is good. Sometimes if you're fortunate, you can get it back. Often you cannot. So hold on to what you got. That's what love songs say all the time. Hold on to what you got. Don't let it go. Oh, you think nobody else wants her? We'll just throw her out in the street and you will see, fool. Somebody else will pick her up before you can count one, two, three, and you can only count to two. Don't let people mislead you about what's best for you. Get the information from a proper source and then chart your course. That is, if you want to stay around here and be in good health. Smoking, then high blood pressure, which can be controlled by medication, exercise, eating a proper diet, and getting medical advice. But these are things we can prevent from getting out of control. However, if you get regular checkups, some of these are the silent killers. You don't even know that you've got it. Then one day, there's a commercial they have, and they're always trying to sell insurance on these commercials. And the wife says to the husband, do you remember so-and-so? And he said, oh, yeah, he's the one who always runs those marathons. She said, not anymore. He said, you mean? She said, mm-hmm. Just like that, he's gone. Then they tell you, this is how you can get some insurance. So when you be the fool and you croak, then your family won't, in addition to losing you, have bills to pay, including the one to bury you. Don't be foolish. But I'm going to go ahead and stop digressing, but I can't help it. After all, being 84 years old gives me some prerogatives. And old people know when to be forgetful. Old people know when not to understand what is being said. They know when to be hard of hearing. So just because somebody's old, don't think that they're out of the game because they've been where you are now. And they've had decades to even think about that after they've been there. But there are privileges that are extended to the elderly. So extend those privileges to me and allow me to digress, which means to go off track just a little bit. I'll go off track, but not off course. These are the basics. Stroke is a common name for several disorders that occur within seconds or minutes after blood supply to the brain is disturbed. And that is the critical element to remember. When your blood flow to your brain is slowed or cut off, the ultimate can be stroke. And within minutes or hours, brain cells will begin to die. And when they die, there is no Lazarus come forth and your brain cells come walking out of that tomb in your brain alive. Once dead, they don't come back. Once a part of your brain dies, it's not coming back. When your brain is completely dead, that's the control system. It's like a circuit. And when somebody breaks that circuit, all the lights go out, television goes off, air conditioning stops, dead everything. A stroke occurs when blood flow to your brain is blocked or blood spills into the brain or surrounding tissues. Within a few minutes to a few hours, brain cells begin to die. About 80% of the strokes are ischematic, ischemic, excuse me, and that's when there is a physical obstruction. Ischemia occurs when there's something physical that interferes with the blood, stroke, blood flow. So that is what causes 80% of the strokes. They occur when blood clots or other particles block arteries to your brain 
and cause severely reduced blood flow, which is ischemia. Less common is a hemorrhagic stroke and that the word comes from the word hemorrhage where there's excessive bleeding and that's where there's bleeding in the brain. And this type of stroke occurs when a blood vessel in your brain leaks or bursts. Then the overflow of blood will lead to a stroke. Your brain is delicate. It is an amazing organ. And one of these days I may talk about what is known about the brain, but there are all kinds of corridors and passageways, memories, creativity, all the things that make you a human being are controlled by what's inside your head. So if somebody hits you on the head and that's what it sounds like, they say your head is solid as a rock. I say, uh huh, that's because there's a precious treasure inside that has to be protected. So the thicker your skull and the harder your skull, the more protection your brain has. On the other hand, if somebody's got a little paper shell, egg shell, skull, that means what's in it ain't worth a nickel. It's like Humpty Dumpty. He fell off the wall and all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put him together again. But if hard headed Harold runs straight head on into a wall, he might see a few stars and be a little dizzy, but he gets up and keeps on ticking, kicking, because the brain is still clicking. Some of this I will skip. The most common signs and symptoms of strokes, and this is important, a sudden numbness, that's where you lose feeling, weakness or paralysis of the face, arm, or leg, usually on one side of the body. So if you don't have any feeling, if you suddenly feel a weakness, or as happens with some people's face, it starts to sag on one side, get help immediately. The sooner you can get help, the less damage that will be caused and there's a good chance of complete recovery. Another symptom is loss of speech or trouble talking or understanding speech. Then sudden blurred, double or decreased vision, not that which happens over a period of time, such as 83 years as is the case with me. So I've got some of these cheaters. No, it's sudden. And when these symptoms develop, don't try to pretend they're not there or ignore them. Call 911. If you are with somebody, have them take you to an emergency room. Hospitals, medical people know the signs, know the symptoms, and they want people to come and seek help as soon as possible. Next, dizziness loss of balance or coordination. Everybody understands that what that is. And if you don't know what it means to be dizzy, just spin around in a room as fast as you can and close your eyes and then open them and see if you can walk a straight line. Or those of you who engage too much with John Barleycorn, when John Barleycorn starts to disorganize the control center and you can't walk a straight line, that's why the first thing the police want to do when they suspect you're under the influence is to have you do things like walk a straight line, touch your nose, close your eyes, touch your nose, things like that. Because you quickly lose your coordination if something is affecting your brain. Confusion or problems with memory, spatial orientation or perception. A sudden severe headache or an unusual headache, which may be accompanied by a stiff neck, facial pain, vomiting, or altered consciousness. These are signs and symptoms of stroke, and they're not to be played with. For most people, a stroke gives no obvious warning, but one possible sign of an impending stroke is what's called a transient ischemic attack 
or TIA. It's also called a mini or small stroke. It's a temporary interruption of blood flow to a part of your brain. It's stroke junior. The signs and symptoms of TIA are the same as for a stroke, but they appear for a short period and then disappear, often in less than five minutes. A TIA does not leave lasting symptoms because the blockage is temporary, but that temporary blockage can lead to these symptoms and you should not ignore them. And if it seems to go right away, still have it checked out. If you experience any warning signs of a stroke or TIA, get help right away. The quicker you diagnose and treat it, the better the outcome will be. Here are some of the risk factors. These are factors that can increase your risk of a stroke. Age, I got that one. I'm 84 years old. I, I gotta live four more years. You know why? Because here I go wandering off again. When I was in grade school, I learned the Gettysburg Address by Heart. It begins four score and seven years ago. A score is 20 years. Four times 20 would be 80. Four score and seven years ago, 87 years ago. But instead of saying it like that, Lincoln was at this uh, military cemetery four score and seven years ago. Our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to proposition that all men are created equal. In three years, here's what I'll be able to say. Four score and seven years ago, my parents brought forth on this earth a new human being conceived in love and dedicated to the proposition that he's here for a purpose and we're going to help him see that purpose go to completion. But I got to be here three more years. And I know my enemies are saying, oh, shucks, we thought he'd croak any minute. And the next thing these black people do, you give him an inch and you take a mile, he'll live three years, which will make him 87. The next thing you know, he'll be talking about being 100. Then if he gets to be 100, he might slow down a little bit, have a little less hair or more hair. And then he'll start talking about 120 years because that's how long Moses had or one of those fellas. But I'm going to take it a step at a time. Three more years and then whatever I can get after that. So age, my risk of stroke doubles and so does yours each decade past 35 years. So those of you who don't have the years that I've got still can have a stroke. Sex, not having sex, but male and female. Stroke affects men and women about equally, but women are more likely to die of stroke than are men. It doesn't say why, but I don't know if it could be that they don't get the same kind of treatment, the same care, or as quickly, I don't know. But based on the figures, women who get stroke will die in greater numbers than men. Race, once again, blacks are at a greater risk of stroke than are people of other races. What is a race? What makes me black? Not my color, this mic microphone stand is black. There are people who consider themselves black and other people do, but they're as white as an albino. It's not color, it's not color. Very dark complexion people are considered white. Very light complexioned people are considered black. And you all know the formula, one drop of Negro blood makes a white person a Negro. That's the word they used to use. To show how kids think, when I was in grade school, I didn't get in many fights, but one time I wanted to get in a fight with this white boy because I didn't like him. And do you know why? I wanted him to give me a bloody nose. I wanted him to do that. And you know what I was going to do? I was going to take some of that blood and put it on him and he'd be a Negro, just like me. If one drop will make a white person a Negro, you know what a lot of blood would. Kids 
hear things and process it differently from the way adults do. But nobody can tell by looking what an individual's quote race unquote is. And this is why when genetic testing occurs, they can come up with a likelihood of where your ancestors originated. Like if it's Sweden or the African continent or somewhere in East Asia, but they cannot tell from that by itself what you are. So it'd be good if people could say anything born of a man and a woman is a human being and that should be enough, but it's not because there are others who want to exploit some people. And if they can find a badge that they can stamp with the term inferior and hang it on people, then they can misuse those people. For us, it was our color. There were not white people in what has been, come to be called North America. Columbus didn't even land in America. And he was on his way to India. And he was an Italian, he was from Genoa. But at any rate, they came here and they were the ones who were massacring and slaughtering people. There were accounts written by the colonists of the, and when I say colonists, the white people were here. They cut the heads off the native people and kick them down the street like footballs. They would fry their heads in frying pans, not to eat, but that's what they did. These are an accounts kept by the white people. So when they talk about savagery, they are looking in the mirror, but they're pushing their failings onto the ones they want to attack, destroy, or exploit. So we were treated like property because of our color. That's another issue, but it affects everything in this country when you are black, like me. So when they say race and blacks are a greater risk, it means those people who are designated black and those who will self describe themselves as black, but some of these white looking black people would not fit in the category of those more likely to have the strokes. So when you deal with science and medicine in this country, race is so, racism is so deeply rooted that there are scientific conclusions that are diluted when the notion of race is injected because nobody can say for sure who is what. But based on the way people are classified, it affects strokes affect black people or those who are deemed to be black more than white people. Since stress, high blood pressure, and these kind of things can aggravate the conditions that lead to stroke. If you're considered black and you're mistreated, then you develop the tension, the high blood pressure, the things that are symptomatic of strokes, and then the symptoms when they become ser serious enough will result in a stroke. So if a person self identifies as black, even if he or she is as white as a sheet and comes into the hospital with a stroke, then that person is a statistic and it goes in the column of black people. But going on, Family history. Your risk is slightly greater if a parent or sibling has a history of stroke or the mini stroke, the TIA, the transient ischemic attack. High blood pressure. High blood pressure or hypertension can weaken and damage blood vessels in and around your brain and increase the chance of plaque forming. And that can lead to atherosclerosis, but plaque is like a hardening or a sticky substance that narrows or blocks arteries. And if they are arteries taking blood to the brain and they are restricted in size or blocked, the blood flow is lessened 
And when blood flow to the brain is lessened to a great enough extent, a stroke occurs. The brain thereby is deprived of blood. The brain cells die. If enough die, the stroke occurs. And if it's a serious enough stroke, then it's curtains. If they can save your life, you may completely lose the use of one side of your body. Continuing. Plaque causes narrowing or blocked arteries. It can also increase the risk of hemorrhage from a weakened artery. And the hemorrhaging is when the vessel ruptures and blood comes out and flows into your tissues. And if that happens in the brain, it can be curtains. Undesirable blood cholesterol levels. High levels of low density. This is where opposites are, come into play. High levels of low density li lipo lipoprotein, which is LDL, is bad for you. Cholesterol that's bad is the HDL, is the LDL, the low levels of high density lipoprotein or HDL is good cholesterol. So the good cholesterol is healthful, bad cholesterol can kill you. Cholesterol, which is bad, increases your risk of narrowed or blocked arteries, including those leading to your brain. Smoking, if you smoke, your risk of a stroke may be two or three times greater than if you don't. Diabetes, and this is common among black people. This condition may increase accumulation of plaque in your arteries and it interferes with your body's ability to break down blood clots. So if you've got diabetes, don't play with that either. Sedentary lifestyle. That means you sit around, move as little as possible, eat potato chips with French onion dip, hot dogs, greasy food, and they, well, I won't go into that, but anyway, when you just sit around and don't do anything. Cardiovascular disease, that is congestive heart failure, a previous heart attack, heart valve disease, or an irregular heart rhythm, atrial fibrillation it's called. All of these can increase your risk of a stroke. So if you just think you've got some of these symptoms, see a doctor. Previous stroke or the mini stroke. If you've already had a stroke and you're older than age 45, your risk of having another one increases by about 10 to 20 times. If you've had a mini stroke, your risk of a stroke increases significantly. Now to treatment. To treat an ischemic stroke, that's where there is an actual physical blockage. The doctors must remove the obstruction and restore blood flow to the brain. And several drugs, by the way, can be used for that purpose. Anything that hinders the flow of blood to the brain is bad. To improve the condition, you have to remove that condition. Antiplatelet medications. These drugs reduce the tendency of blood to clot by preventing blood platelets from sticking together as they pass through narrowed arteries. This is not a part of it, but you know that there's a disease that black people got and it's called sickle cell anemia. Blood cells are circular. They're called platelets. And in the middle, there's kind of a depression on both sides. So if you look at it, it could be like a donut, but the hole is filled. Well, they carry oxygen, but in sickle cell, the cells are misformed. So when they flow through, they don't go through the arteries like they should. And it's certain junctures, they will clump together, stop blood flow, 
and result in excruciating pain. So if somebody has sickle cell anemia, as it's called, that is something that does befall black people more than white people, just like there's some diseases that affect Jews more than other people. And when these conditions arise, there are specialists who know how to deal with them. Because of the opioid problem, there were treatments for sickle cell that people when they were having an attack could go to and they could immediately sometimes get an injection. But when the opioid crisis arose and it arose because young white people were getting these opioids, older white people were getting bogus prescription and when it became a problem for them, it was a problem for everybody. So the black people who had been diagnosed with sickle cell and treated for it could no longer get the treatment or the injections that they needed. So they suffered excruciating pain needlessly because white people had abused opioids and the opi opioid manufacturers, big pharma as it's called, were deliberately having doctors overprescribe so that the pharmaceutical companies could make a lot of money. And it is the love of money that is the root of all evil, but it was white people's problem that resulted in black people with diagnosable conditions. And even the doctors who had treated them could not get the opioid medication needed. So these people were suffering excruciating pain and some even died because white people had a problem. You know, like they say, so-and-so over here catches a cold and so-and-so over there gets pneumonia. Anyway, there are several things that can affect blood flow, but going on. Anticoagulant medications, the drug Oh, the drug low molecular weight heparin works immediately and may be injected to reduce clotting. War warfarin, and by the way, warfarin is uh, one of the in main ingredients in rat poisons because they will cause bleeding and rats and mice who ingest it will bleed to death. And warfarin is a part of some of these medications it also helps prevent blood clots, but it takes several days to become fully effective. Tissue plasminogen activator, or TPA. This clot busting medication may prevent or minimize damage to your brain by dissolving a blood clot and restoring blood flow. However, it's most effective when used within four and a half hours of the onset of the stroke. It also increases the risk of bleeding in your brain. If it's going to bust a clot, it can also increase bleeding beyond the point where it should. Before receiving TPA, you will undergo a computerized tomography or CT or CAT scan to detect any existing bleeding. Then they know where to go from there with the treatment. After an ischemic stroke, this is one caused by a physical blockage, you may need surgery or balloon therapy to clear your carotid artery to prevent another stroke. You heard a lot of talk about the carotid or artery when they talked about Chauvin having his knee on George Floyd's neck for nine and a half minutes and cut off blood flowing through the carotid artery. His brain didn't get the blood it needed. He died. But anyway, this would clear your carotid artery to prevent stroke. Your doctor may also recommend medications to reduce the likelihood of another clot forming and to manage any treatable risk factors. But naturally, these are medications that you get only by way of prescription. Treatment for hemorrhagic stroke typically involves controlling blood pressure and limiting fluids and possible medication to minimize brain tissue swelling. Surgery or other interventions may be necessary to repair the cause of the artery rupture. 
So when there's a rupture, there's a hemorrhage or the gushing out of blood. And this condition is very serious and needs to be dealt with, obviously, in an emergency setting. What you can do to resist, reduce your risk of stroke, first, develop good health habits. Prevention is better than cure. Eat a brain healthy diet. Foods that may offer some protection against stroke include fruits, vegetables, oatmeal, beans, soy products, and foods rich in omega-3 fatty acids like fatty fish. Eat less cholesterol and saturated fat. If you can't control your cholesterol with dietary changes, talk to your doctor about medications that can help, but do it under a doctor. Don't go get these things off the shelves in drugstores and pharmacies. A lot of times, these things are called supplements, not medicines. So the FDA has nothing to do with regulating them. So you don't know what you're getting when you get these products. If you think you've got a condition, go to the one who's trained to address it. And that's a doctor, not one of these hucksters. Maintain a healthy weight. Being overweight contributes to other risk factors for stroke. Exercise regularly. If you can lower your blood pressure, increase your level of good cholesterol, and improve the overall health of your blood vessels and heart, you can do all of these things through regular exercise. Now, you know what? You've got a natural weight connected to your body. It's called your head. You can do all kinds of neck exercises. You can do some from side to side. And if you are cracking, you know that you don't have the limberness you need. You can go front to back. You can go circular this way, circular that way, this way and that way and this way and that way. If you're just sitting down, but don't do it when other people are around. With your posture, try to think consciously of sitting straight. Shoulders back, your chest opens, your chest expands, your lungs can take in more air. But by the way, some of these conditions do affect your lungs, which need blood. And just by coincidence, our friend, put that in quotes, COVID-19, do the same thing. And that's why they need a ventilator. They need a device to force oxygen into your lungs because you cannot do it. You're helpless. And they put the tubes down in you. And the doctors who do it wear these plastic shields because there may be stuff coughed up or vomited up. They don't want that because a person can swallow the vomit, it can go down the wrong tube, it can enter your lungs, all kind of side problems. But if they get the tube in correctly, then you still have to worry because the purpose of the lungs, they're like a kind of spongy tissue. They take carbon dioxide out of the blood and replace it with oxygen. You breathe in, oxygen, you breathe out carbon dioxide. If you don't have healthy lungs, you need assistance. If your lungs are in bad enough condition, that's when the ventilator is needed. More people now have to be on ventilations because of these, they call them variants, I call them deviants. They deviate from. The scientists and doctors say they're variations. They're really mutations. Nature wants her living things to go on living. Even if it's a bacterium, the word bacteria, it ends in IA, that makes it plural. A single one of those brothers or sisters is a bacterium. In order for the bacterium, which carries on life functions, it's a living organism, nature equips her children to live in a hostile, survive, survive in a hostile environment. So if medications or antivirus, antiviral medications, those that are designed 
to kill bacteria. And by the way, these ba antibacterial cleaning products won't do anything to a virus. A virus and a bacterium are not the same. Now, this is an oversimplification, but think of virus as ve vegetable. Think of bacterium as animal. What affects one will not affect the other. So when these unwholesome substances enter your body that are designed to maintain the health of your body, but destroy the life of the virus or the bacterium, then nature has equipped those to develop a safety mechanism, a protection against that which is being inject, injected into you to kill them. So to keep the living organism of the human being alive, the living organisms, bacteria and viruses must be killed. But since they live, in order for them to live, they have to have the capacity, if not in each individual one, in bacteria as a whole or viruses as a whole, to develop a protection so that they can survive. And it's why sometimes you need a booster shot to maintain that ability to handle Cyrus the virus. And some foolish people out there are going to say, no way, Jose, until they get it. And they're showing more people on television now, some on ventilators saying, if only I had known. No, if only you had paid attention. A lot of these politicians who are telling you foolish people, you have the right not to do this or do that. If you don't want to get a vaccination, don't get it. If you don't want to wear a mask, don't wear it. Their families are being taken care of. Lindsey Graham, one of the top Republicans in the Senate, has COVID and he was vaccinated. See, he hadn't admitted being vaccinated before. It's a Republican article of faith not to get vaccinated. No, to tell you idiots not to get vaccinated because they've politicized it now. It's a hot button issue. The Republicans and to some extent Democrats, progressives, whatever party they belong to, want to get hold of something that is in the popular consciousness to get people's attention. And if to do that, in order to get your attention for political purposes, they have to put your very life at stake, they'll do it. So now under the rubric of freedom of choice, they're saying you have the right to choose not to be vaccinated. I listen to a radio station when I'm driving called Boomer and some fool was on there talking about how this whole thing is a hoax. There's no such thing as this virus. And he was praising some guy who gets up and goes to his window every morning and hollers, I can't, I'm tired of this. I'm not gonna take it anymore. Meaning he's gonna wear a mask. He's gonna do what he wants to. He won't be vaccinated. And the guy talking on the program was saying to prove it's a hoax. Look what they're doing in Israel. They're not doing all of this. It's almost as if they heard because now Israel is providing for booster shots for the Israelis. So people will give misinformation in their ignorance about things happening in the world. Since it's said on a radio station, and ordinarily you may listen to the station, you think that the station manager has vetted this and is valid information. The station manager knows no more than this idiot that they're allowing to spew this misinformation. You need to read the newspaper as I do if you don't use the computer. They have news sources that you have access to on the computer that I don't, but I subscribe to multiple magazines. I try to get all the information I can. And if everybody else is going to say, I am not anti-science, I'm anti-medicine, then I'm going to be the last man standing. I go to people who because of study, training and experience, know more about what I'm going to deal with than I do instead of puttering around with it. I wouldn't try to fix a carburetor in my car. I wouldn't try to revitalize a battery. If my battery dies, then I get a tow 
to some place to get a charge or I have a charger. I do have a charger. But if something goes wrong and the charger doesn't work, I don't try to open the battery and fix it. None of that. The only thing I used to do for my car is put in oil. I don't even do that now. Some of these service stations, when it comes to air, will not have a nozzle or a little cap that will fit over that little thing sticking out of your tire that you put the air in. So you have to go to the dealer. Well, that's what I do. Dealers have to make a living too. Even though it costs me money, I go to the people who do what I need to have done. And I know I'm going to have to pay for it. There's no such thing as a free lunch. What I hope people get from this little bit that I'm offering is at least an understanding of the fact that there are things that can be done to help you and you ought to go to those things. And I'm gonna wrap this up now. Drink alcohol in moderation if you drink at all. Heavy alcohol consumption increases your risk of high blood pressure and stroke. And stroke is no joke. Control diabetes and high blood pressure. Eat right, exercise, control your weight, and take your medication as directed. Quit smoking, not just due to cancer, but stroke. Quit smoking. There are counseling services and medications that can help you stop if you're unable to quit on your own and admit it. That's what the help is there for. Be intelligent enough to reach out and accept what will keep you alive if you want to go on living. Manage stress. This is something that black people, Latinos, Latinx, Native Americans have because of the racism that still exists and guides and governs everything in this country. Stress can cause a temporary spike in your blood pressure. It can also increase your blood's tendency to clot, which may elevate your stroke risk. I told you all about Evil Eye Flegel and Lil Abner created by Al Cap. And when he put the evil eye on you, a mild hit was a whammy. A big hit was a double whammy. If he wanted to just get your attention, he'd give you a one-third whammy. But if you are what they now call a person of color, a triple or quadruple whammy is what we face every day. And people in the legislature were surprised that at my age, we would start the session at nine o'clock and sometimes go through the noon hour I never left the floor. I never sat down. I didn't eat. I didn't drink water or anything. I didn't go to the bathroom. And they wondered how I was able to do it. And at my age, sometimes I would be in my office and what was going on wasn't very important. But when they needed people to vote, they'd have a call of the house. My office was always on the first floor and it was some distance when I got to the second floor to get to the chamber, so they'd see me at my advanced age, taking the stairs two at a time, not keeling over. I'm not going to let myself deteriorate because that's what other people are doing. They cannot live for me. They will not die for me. And I get all kinds of letters now asking if I will run for the legislature again. And I tell people, after all the time I've been there, I was in the legislature 46 years. I was on the learning community for four years. So that's 50 years of my 84 years spent in public service. There was no salary at all for the learning community. I was a barber. Any work that was honest and would pay a decent wage, I was willing to do, but I'd never take a job where somebody can order me to do something under pain of leave, losing the job. I cannot take 
that kind of mistreatment. And it's mistreatment to me, not to everybody else. Don't you direct your life according to me. When I used to talk in the schools, the kids would see the way I dressed and they say, Senator Chambers, you don't wear a suit, do you? I say, no. And they say, why don't you wear a suit? I said, because I don't want to. And if the clothes that I wore to cut hair was good enough for the people who gave me my living, they were good enough for anybody. And if people don't like the way I dress, don't look at me. And if they have a stiff neck, I say, that's why you can swivel your head. So if I'm sitting here and you don't want to look at me, turn it like this. And if you can't swivel your neck, that's why you have lids on your eyes. You can close your eyes and you don't have to see. I said, but let me tell you one thing. I was working as a barber for myself. I rented a chair. I was my own boss. If you need to get a job and you need to wear a suit and a clean shirt, and a necktie, don't let the refusal to dress what they call appropriately for the job stop you from getting a job. Don't say, well, Senator Chambers wears sweatshirts and jeans. You're not Senator Chambers. You're not in the legislature. Senator Chambers had no boss to give an account to. So if you go for the job and one of the requirements is to dress a certain way, and you want that job, you dress that way. Dress to the nines. Be what they call in the old days, as sharp as a tack. But don't let clothes keep you from getting to where you need to go. You cannot live your life the way I live mine because the desires of my life are not the desires of yours. The desires of your life are not the desires of my life. The things of this world, I wear loosely. I've never had a big car, don't want a big car. I got a big house now, but it's not that I started out and wanted a big house. But there's nothing outside of myself that means more to me than my health. And I am going to terminate my time with you today. And for those who came in late, tuned in late, and I don't know what rock you was under, but you don't know who I am. I'm Ernie Chambers. And as the canary said, when they left the door to the cage open, I'm out of here. So my time is up. And as that old white guy used to give, the news used to say, thank you for yours. Thank you for watching the Ernie Chambers Show. If you'd like to make suggestions, email us at ewcfacts at gmail.com. That's ewcfacts at gmail.com. This has been an EWC Communication Production.